a great pleasure to be back in Clayton. I was here two years ago. I was here a couple uh, months ago for a meeting, so I've been Jen and Seth for a while. And they told me that there's actually summer here sometimes, and I'm anxiously awaiting an invitation sometime during the summer. <laughs> Not like we're having much of a winter this year, but still. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of go on a little bit of a journey that, that will take us um, to the global scale, um, down to the St. Lawrence, into my backyard, uh, back in time, and then hopefully kind of just wrap it up with, uh, with a take-home message. Um, I'm not heavy on graphs. I probably was going to talk about using the pointer. Don't know that I'll need it. I don't have many stats, graphs uh, to point to, but I will be uh, showing some pictures and, uh, and talking and hopefully uh, providing a bit of entertainment and, and I hope some inspiration uh, as we go forward. So uh, I use this quote often uh, when I kick off presentations. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm not getting any kickbacks from Fred Pierce, but his book, When the Rivers Run Dry, is a, is a great book. It's a good global look at what happens uh, and what is happening with our relationship as humans with rivers uh, around the planet. So when we talk about um, fresh water at WWF, our program really um, is trying to make this connection between water for nature and water for people. And as I walk through this um, talk, I will uh, kind of touch on what this rather techy term environmental flows means um, as the kind of scientific foundation of our work. Um, but I try to come back to a key point that um, that statement, water for nature, water for people, is not water for nature versus water for people. Ultimately, we need to figure that out in the long term uh, to make it a bit of both. So, um, I do have a bit of an image. Uh, this is, uh, many of us have seen, I'm sure, in our education is, is the hydrologic cycle. And um, it's, you know, I, 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 this is where I always start. These pictures fascinate me, and just to stare at that, but uh, you know, there's all sorts of great ones online that you can watch interactively. Um, but in this day and age, there's actually something um, missing from the picture. And I kind of just superimposed it onto this picture. <laughs> um, it's us, and, and um, I have a technical reference for this. Um, there's, a, there's not for the stick people. Um, there's a, a paper that, that came out, I think, in 2009 that that essentially um, made the claim that humans are now the driving force of river flows in Canada, or sorry, in Canada, around the world. So we are the dominant drivers of a huge component of the hydrologic cycle. So. In fact, while I've colored this up with my stick people that I brought off the internet, thanks to Google, um, th this is in fact a very true statement, right? That we are now the dominant force driving river flows, but other hydrologic processes on the planet. So when you kind of blow up to the scale and look at some of the statistics, it becomes rather apparent why that's the case. Just a couple that I um, have kind of kept track of over time, um, or that I borrowed from people that have kept track over time. Uh, in 1950, when I wasn't born, uh, there were 500 large dams on the planet, and currently the number is sitting around 50,000. So that is somewhere in the range of two large dams constructed each and every day for 50 to 60 years. So a pretty substantial transformation <coughs> on a global scale. We extract somewhere in the range of 4 trillion meters cubed of water uh, on an annual basis from natural systems. And to put that in a little bit better perspective, um, if my staff did the calculations correctly, that's about 50 times the flow of the Nile on an annual basis. So a significant amount of water. Um, stats are great, um, graphs even better, I like pictures. So when you start to think about this in terms of pictures, um, you start to get the sense from those statistics that uh, when we talk about how we manage water on the planet, we're kind of left someone out of the equation, we've left nature out of the equation. And we kind of lost track of the fact that the water that we share, sorry, the water that we have on this planet is water that we share with all life on Earth. So when you dig a bit deeper, and you start to see some of the startling pictures. That's not it. I forgot how to superimpose that because that is something that we want to be uh, sharing this water with and, and a prominent feature in the, pro uh, in the program today, obviously, the, the muskrat. When you look at where we've really kind of messed up the balance, if you will, between humans and nature, um, Take a look globally at some of the, the crises that we're seeing. This is the Yellow River in China, and that is in fact someone doing Tai Chi on what was once the riverbed. 
similarly, on, on our continent, uh, the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, that is shared between the southern U.S. and Mexico, running dry before it reaches its mouth. Um, but often, of course, uh, these are kind of the extremes and very visible cases that you can see. Often, the imbalance, if you will, between humans and nature is much more subtle. And we've heard a lot about that today, I think, when you think about the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario system, that um, those subtleties of transformations of marsh meadows, meadow marshes into, into cattail complexes, uh, or, or monocultures, really, are, are much more subtle than these images of rivers running dry, obviously. And I was begging for some sunlight. <laughs> That's it. Um, and I think the point there is, is one that is, is important to keep top of mind as we work through this BB7 uh, new plan from the IJC. I'll just hold on a second. This is <laughs> Do the bunny rabbit. <laughs> So, of course, one of the rivers that we looked at was the St. Lawrence. And 
This is um, a couple quotes from a book by a well-known Canadian author, Hugh McClendon, who, uh, who passed a few years back. And I just use these to kind of reflect on um, the, the, the nature or the, uh, the kind of how the St. Lawrence River um, factors into the, to the psyche of Canadians, and he is a well-known Canadian writer, but also um, how it relates uh, and forms a relationship between our two countries. So, I mean, I think the first one is self-explanatory, and, and I think the second one really talks about how um, Canada and the U.S. are really divided by this, but in many ways defines this, this, this river. Um, it's interesting um, how we tend to think about the river, I think. We, we often um, recognize that the St. Lawrence was so critical in developing Canada as we know it. Um, we, we see it largely, uh, in many ways, as, as one of the, uh, the country's most important working rivers. You know, when you can think about it in terms of the hydropower it produces as the seaway, um, it moved a lot of, uh, of people and cargo across this country and continues to do so. Uh, we also uh, have a healthy respect for it as an ecosystem. Um, and in terms of how we see the St. Lawrence as being shared these days between uh, Canada and the U.S., I think. One of the key challenges in Canada is when you talk about um, binational issues around water resources between Canada and the U.S., inevitably Canadians feel like you're all just here to steal our water. <laughs> and I mean, that's something really to get past. I, mean, I get frustrated. I always put my hand up at talks in Canada when people say Canada has 20% of the world's water supply. And I have to say, you know what, actually there's a line down the middle of that 20% of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence system. And it's not all ours. And uh, it's not all there to be used by us. And I don't really think uh, that the bulk of, uh, of Americans are out to steal that from us. Uh, the St. Lawrence clearly though is an important river um, uh, for Canadians, as it is for you folks. Um, this is uh, unfortunately not a great um, slide um, that is drawn from our report rivers at risk that is, it reflects how we assess the St. Lawrence River among these 10 rivers that we looked at. The key point to be made is in the top corner there, um, and we kind of use the status and trend approach in, in doing this assessment. And based on this um, manipulation of flows and the impacts on ecosystems related to that, we kind of rank the St. Lawrence as, as a poor status and declining. And one of the things that we pointed to um, with the help of those that we interviewed, uh, as as an important step forward was the plan that we've been here talking about today and its predecessors, and a recommendation that the IJC and the governments uh, of Canada and the U.S. and now, um, I think importantly, the states and provinces uh, um, move forward with the plan to restore more natural flows through the system. So, I think. Um, Having now dug into uh, this new plan and done my best to understand the many years of study that have gone into it, and, and uh, I'm grateful for the summary tables, Frank, because they're very useful. Um, this looks to me very much like an opportunity where changing how we manage flows and levels through the system not only leads to um, environmental benefits and not by economic benefits, but there are also benefits. Um, to conventional economic interests, hydropower and, and commercial navigation. And to me, this is a critical um, point. It's a, it's, a, it's a really important example, if we can move this along, of a shift in thinking and a shift in acting, where we're not living in competition with nature, as those shots of the Yellow River and the Rio Grande might suggest, but moving towards a, really, uh, a situation where we're living in harmony with nature. Um, and really, for me, um, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Um, and this is a shot of myself and my little guy. Uh, this is me taking me to my backyard at a creek uh, not far from my house. That we need to come around to thinking that, um, that when we restore and protect water for nature, we're actually protecting water for ourselves and for our kids and for all the things that we depend on and the quality of life that we're after. And moving the plan forward, um, uh, BB7, which we really should come up with a better name, but I guess that's what we're stuck with, um, is, is really going to be about, in my view, um, getting people behind it. And it's such a pleasure to be working with uh, Stephanie and Jen and uh, folks, our friends at the Nature Conservancy, David Klein, and others, um, 
on what is emerging as a campaign to push this along and hopefully see it through over the course of the year or so that it takes to go through the public information sessions, public hearings, and I encourage you all to get involved. And to that end, uh, I've known Steph and Jen for about two years. I've been bugging Jen, or sorry, Steph, most of that time for a t-shirt, a B-plus t-shirt. And uh, I finally got one today, so it's still here. But I think, I guess, the point I'm trying to make is, and I was looking for some masking tape, because I really wanted to put a BB7 on the front of this. <laughs> I, I think it's truly time. I think this is going to take a lot of um, attention. This is going to take a lot of um, education on our part to get people involved and interested. And uh, I think that there's an important precedent to be set here by um, putting this plan ultimately into action, because that's what's going to ensure that we uh, have a healthy relationship with uh, our environment going forward. So I said that I was going to take you uh, around the world a bit, into my backyard, and now I'm going to take you back in time and kind of go off script a little bit, uh, or off topic, if you will. Um, I have a good friend who is a bit of an unknown um, staple in the uh, independent music scene in Canada. And I think it was two years ago when I was here um, speaking, I had just gotten my Twitter account. And I was having a heck of a time. So I was tweeting all about talking tomorrow at the Save the River Winter Weekend. Mm -hmm. And he, he sent me something on Twitter that said, that name rings a bell for some reason. And uh, I saw him Tuesday evening. He played, he's from Ottawa. He played a show in Toronto. And uh, he said, I figured out where I, I, I recognize this whole Save the River people. So he sent me this the other day. Oh, sorry. This is my image of humans in harmony with nature. Um, he sent me this the other day. And this is from 1987 a benefit dance, if you will, uh, in Cornwall. And hmm. my friend Chris's band, uh, the stand, was playing 60s music at that point, which is a topic for another time. With, uh, <laughs> you know, he's not playing that music anymore. <laughs> but I mean, in some respects, this is also, you know, I started at the world being a big place. Um, in some respects, it's actually a very small place. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's really um, always blows me away when I come to a place like this that's a small town that is not unlike the one that I grew up in in southern Ontario and through various conversations over the course of a couple of years you make a connection back to a friend and his music uh, that had an influence in Cornwall and I hope on Save the River sometime in the late 80s when our heritage were all a lot worse than <laughs> some of the other things. So. <laughs> so with that, thanks very much. I'll take some questions if you have some ask, but uh, I look forward to participating going forward and, and pushing with you folks here and others uh, this plan through to restore the health of St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario. Thank you. sense of what concerns there might be and, and open up a dialogue. Um, as you know, the 
you know, um, Quebec is what makes um, Canada an interesting place often. And, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite encouraged that, that um, in the college for having this um, meeting with NGOs, that uh, the vast majority of those that we invited um, were very interested in, in coming and having an open dialogue about it. So we're not we just not trying to push a position. It's mostly to, to start to listen and, and understand what the concerns might be, and then ultimately, um, as needed, um, bring those to the IJC's attention because really it's the IJC plan to to to, uh, to provide detailed big information on it. So that's that's beyond our capacity. So, uh, but I mean, I think it will continue to be something to, to be aware of and working on over the course of the, the next year. Because I, being an engineer, it's my belief that if in the fall period we hold back water flow and we try to get a higher winter time level, during that winter time period, November, December, January, the level is going to be lower in my I can come back up in Montreal until the spring runoff coming down the Ottawa River and runoff coming into the Great Ontario Basin. Yeah, there, there is actually a concern. <laughs> there, there is a concern that, that by not drawing down Lake Ontario, that could pose more of a flooding risk to Montreal in the spring. And, and that's mainly the risk. Yeah, that's more of the concern than the low flow winter levels, and, and that's something we've been working to address. I mean, I think this will come up again and again, and, and to have a response to that will be important. Uh, what are the implications of, of low water levels, um, especially if there's extended years of low water levels uh, through the whole system? What are, what are the implications going to be for the, for the St. Lawrence River going forward? Oh yeah, I know. You know what? I fooled myself that if I just changed my slides around a little bit, I would have uh, knocked myself off course. But proof that's the smartest thing to do. We uh, just to give you a bit of background, we have four um, key programs at WWF Canada that we're working on under a, a long-term strategic plan: fresh water, climate and uh, renewable energy, the Arctic, and uh, oceans. Uh, and I direct the National Freshwater Program, and we, our uh, communications team uh, decided, uh, this is about a year and a half ago, that we wanted to commission some art pieces to kind of capture our programs. And we sat down with the artists and were kind of asked in one sentence, what do you want me to portray uh, in an illustration? And I said, um, I said, uh, the river is within us. And, and that's what he turned it into. So if you, other than the little devil guy that often <laughs> has to defend it, he's not the devil. Um, quite happy with that. James Yang, I think, is, I think that's his, his, his first name, James. His last name is Yang, he's the illustrator. Hmm. Yes? Could you comment on World Wildlife Fund's activities regarding invasive species things in the water? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're actually not actively involved in, in invasive, invasive species in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence and, and um, system, or really um, at all as a core focus of our work. We're certainly supportive of, of activities of others in, in terms of you know, dealing with things like the Asian carp potential in the Asian. Um, and I should also be clear, as I always am, and my uh, colleagues know that well, I was going to say, you have to put WWF hyphen Canada after it when you put my title up or anything about us up because I, I can't. Uh, we, we're a federation, so I'm not speaking on behalf of WWF US, who has a very different um, approach to their conservation programs. They're much more global. Yeah, I would, I would just say in follow up that um, you know, it's, it's actually good news to me because uh, when an organization tries to get involved in too many different things, sometimes it can get diluted. Their efforts, and I think it's wise. There's plenty of other people working on this. You know, that's probably a wise move. To say, you know, this is something others can do better, maybe, or we should focus on what others are not doing. So that's. I'm very happy now to hear that this is being recorded. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I use that often. I'm often asked why you're just not doing this or that or this. <laughs>
Yeah. Or today. <laughs> yeah. Go, so, thanks for coming. Um, and certainly want to hold anyone up for drinks. But uh, your colleagues on this side of the border will be the same, feel the same way about the U7 that you folks do in North Coast. Colleagues at WWF? Yeah. Uh, so I just alluded to that their, their approach to their programming is very, very different from ours. Um, we have uh, national programs in Canada and very little involvement, although growing, in the global WWF network. We're a federation of organizations, so there's not some Uber boss sitting in Switzerland telling everybody what to do. Um, so, so, I, so notionally, I would say that um, my colleague, uh, equivalent at, at WWF US who incidentally is leaving his job for another one in, in a couple of weeks would be supportive of it and has uh, expressed interest in the past about being involved in Great Lakes St. Lawrence issues but they're driven by global priority places, seven or eight of them um, and, and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence system is not one. So I would think the notion of protecting and restoring more natural flows and levels, that's at the core of our work around the world, right? Um, you'll see that in, in almost all of our freshwater programming around Will they um, be writing letters and lobbying in, in D.C.? No. Certainly, you know, the climate change and uh, mitigation strategies that are looking for renewable energy supplies in Ontario, we have got commitments to get off coal fired power. It certainly is driving impacts in other areas and hydropower as well. Yes? Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times today that um, public education is lacking and needed regarding the and erosion and things like that. over a five to seven year period. 
At the same time, we're pushing a public policy agenda uh, and being, and, and you know, we're going to try to get some interactive tools. It's all kind of, I get in trouble because a lot too much of it's up here right now, but we're trying to get this moving and, and through a, a visible campaign, uh, hopefully generate some awareness and attention to this. It's, it's very difficult, as I'm sure you folks know, um, and, or maybe it's different here, but for us, um, you know, there's always the shrug, especially in southern Ontario, how could there possibly be a water problem here? Look out the window, right? You're looking at 20% of the world's fresh water, right? So there is an education issue. And I think it's actually about bringing people back to um, a recognition that this water that we share is water that we share with all life on Earth. It's, it's, you know, the turning the tap off when you brush your teeth is a good lesson on the way, but it's not going to solve all the problems. You might know that I have to get a little bit close. <laughs> well, thank you so much, John. Thank you.